Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see my mic work since I threw it across the front of the auditorium here. Uh, and Jeremy, you are not high maintenance. There are several on our staff that are, and I'm probably one of them, but you are maybe a little too low maintenance if you check out your office. But uh, <laughs> he knows where everything is, but no one else does, but that's okay. It's his office. We're glad everybody's here. We want to welcome our live stream uh, online. And I just want to say uh, thank you so much for, for joining us, not just on Sundays, uh, but on Wednesdays. And, and anytime we have something going on, uh, there's, uh, and if you've never checked out the live stream, it's more than just what happens on Sundays and Wednesdays in, in Bible class on Sunday mornings. There's stuff, our audiovisual team drops stuff every week. Right now, there's a great series going on that Tommy Inman is doing on angels. And if you've never heard Tommy Inman teach uh, in, a, in that type of setting, you're really missing something. He's, he's got a lot of years of experience of teaching, and he's putting that to work uh, in uh, continuing in his retirement. So go check that out. A new video drops every Tuesday with some teaching. Uh, and, and it's not just people. Uh, our audience is just not made up of people that that are from out there that tune in here. But we have people that were here that that go out and still maintain uh, a connection through that live stream. So I want to say to Callie, Callie Grace, uh, thank you. Even though you're in college and soon graduated, thanks for tuning in. And, and on a personal note, Callie, whatever it is, you got it. You got it. You, you can face it and you can deal with it. And you are deeply loved by your church family here, as everybody on our live stream is. And so I want to say also welcome to our uh, instrumental service over in the Fellowship Center. Beautiful worship this morning. I got to sit in for part of that. Um, so a lot of great things happening. Thank you so much for being a part of that. I uh, also want to mention uh, uh, one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, there's a lot of favorite people I have, but one of my favorite people in the world is Betty Cooper. Uh, she is uh, uh, throwing her hat in the ring for, the, for Monroe Mayor. Uh, and so, uh, hey, let's give it up for Betty. There's not a person in the world that doesn't love Betty Cooper, and uh, she, uh, and, you know, entering that political arena is a sticky, messy place sometimes, but she'll bring character to it. So uh, she is actually officially announcing her candidacy tomorrow, four to six, over in Monroe. Uh, so if you want to hang out with Betty, wave at us, Betty. Uh, there's Betty Cooper right there. If you want to know more about Betty uh, and what her platform, you can go to her website, bettywardcooper.org, and uh, find out more about that. But also, you can just come hang out with Betty, and I promise you, Betty's a great person to hang out with uh, and a beautiful person. So uh, I appreciate uh, when godly people enter into the arenas that are all out there. So, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, our scripture reader this morning is Jacob Cook. Jacob's my hunting buddy, and, and last year, last year, he cleared my lanes for me in my back and my neck, thank you, as well as my heart. Thank you so much, because you did such a good job. I didn't have to do anything this year. Uh, so, appreciate you. He's going to be uh, reading from... So this is Luke 11, verses 33 through 36. Is my mic? There you there. go. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they will put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is also full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body is also full of darkness. See to it, then, that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. One more. And I believe I was also given Matthew 4.16. The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. Good work. Good job. Good job. I hope you get. I hope you get a big one this year, buddy. And I hope I get one too. You know, uh, we talk about darkness. How many of you were uh, were afraid of the dark when you were young? Slept with a nightlight. How many of you still afraid of the dark? Yeah. 
Thank you for you brave souls that still say I'm afraid of the dark. It's a frightening place, isn't it? Uh, scariest place in the world to me is Camp Chioka at night by yourself. There is no light shining anywhere. It's a, uh, whenever, whenever you're in darkness, uh, you're left to your imagination. When you can't see, you're left to what goes on and what, what you think may be there, which is a scary place to be, isn't it? And we've often said the, some of the scariest places in the world is between our own ears and what we can imagine. When I was nine years old, uh, my mother, who was a single mom, uh, lost her sight. She had some complications after a surgery and was immediately overnight thrown into a, a world of darkness. Now, for a nine-year-old boy, I didn't know what to do with that. You know, that was a time, and my, oldest, my older sister, who was 13 years older than me, kind of had, and she was married, had her own life, had to come kind of take care of us, and we depended on rides. But it was a very, a very scary place. But at that time, in the late 70s, people didn't say, you really, they, my family just didn't prepare you for that. You just dealt with it. I didn't know. No one told me until uh, I was at my grandmother's house and they had brought her home from the hospital. We were living in New Orleans and I hadn't seen my mom in a few weeks. And I go running out to her and she does this because she heard me running, but she couldn't see me. And I didn't know what to do with that as a nine-year-old boy. But I can remember for months after that, she was scared. She was afraid because of the darkness she was in. She was scared to cook. She was scared to get up and move around the house, so she stayed in bed a lot. She would find her way to a recliner in the house, and she would sit. And we lived on baked potatoes and TV dinners. They taught me how to operate the oven, and to this day, I will not eat a TV dinner. I will eat a baked potato, but I will not eat a TV dinner to this day. And so, if you've been to my house and you know that Karen and I like to cook for people, that's why. Because we had to learn to live, or eat something than a Swanson's Hungry Man meal uh, and Salisbury steak and fake gravy. You know, you just, you just, you learn, but it was scary times uh, for her because she was in darkness. Even more frightening, Jesus says, is when that darkness that's out there begins to creep inside. You know, it's, it's interesting that when darkness falls, People like to, especially when we get older, we like to be home before dark. I don't like to drive after dark because I don't see as well. But boy, when darkness happens, that's when bad things start happening. Most evil is done under the cover of darkness unless the darkness is inside. And that's when it's broadcast in, in broad daylight. Because dark people do dark things in daylight. Romans 1 bears that out. But when Jesus said, when darkness in us creeps inside, it's allowed to grow. It goes beyond scary, and many of us have experienced, it goes to out of control devastation in our life when we're full of darkness. And at some level, we've all been affected by the darkness in ourselves or the darkness that overflows out of people and has hit us. This, is, this interaction that Jesus is having here is the end of a section. And he comes to some pretty strong words. In fact, he, he says, Matthew recounts it, says that how, if the darkness in, is inside of you, oh, how great is that darkness. It's overwhelmingly dark. So what would cause Jesus to get to these strong words? This section, Mike, uh, started last week in chapter 11, whenever his disciples came along and said, hey, teach us to pray. And he did, and that's how we ended our service last week, with, with, with the Lord's Prayer. And it's how we end on Friday night, with praying to God and, and, and doing that simple prayer from the heart that, that God, that Jesus taught us how to do. And then he comes along in that same section in chapter 11 and says, look, God knows how to take care of you. God knows what you need, and he'll take care of you. You simply ask. He's giving you me, Jesus, he's giving me into this world to save you. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. So how did he get from Father knows best, Father knows how to do good things for you. In fact, he's giving me you, giving you me and the Holy Spirit to you to, oh, you are full of darkness. Don't be full of darkness. That's the meat of this sandwich that we're getting into today. And that brings us to our setting in Luke chapter 11. So read with me a little bit here in verse 14. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. 
When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowd was amazed. Think about that word. They were amazed. It was, wow. The wow factor was overwhelmingly beyond 10. But some of them said, by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. You know, Jesus is doing the work of God. John, the apostle, says it's through these miracles that he was proving himself to be the Son of God, to being God in flesh. In the crowd, there's two groups. There are those who are amazed. They see it, and they lean into it, and they're drawn to it, and they believe. And then there's the cynical, the scoffers, the unbelievers, the doubters. And then you have some fans in there too. But they're looking at it saying, oh, it's by the prince of demons that he, Beelzebub, that he's casting out demons. And then some are like, hey, show us another miracle. It'd be probably that similar group that came along in John 6 when he fed 5,000 people. And the next morning they find him and they said, hey, what, do you, what, what miracles are you going to do for us? Hey, I know, manna from heaven. They had been fed the night before. What were they looking for the next morning? Breakfast. They were looking for more because they couldn't be satisfied enough. They were fans just following from a distance and wanted to see the show. And then there were unbelievers who weren't believing and scoffing. And and, and Matthew and Mark tell us that these were Pharisees and teachers of the law. And whenever you see these two come together, there's always going to be a confrontation. There's always going to be some scoffers. And instead of being the ones, the Pharisees and these teachers that said, let's get back to the law and point in these, in, in the teachers of the law who studied it, who were supposed to be pointing to Jesus, they were the ones that were discrediting him and not only discrediting him saying, ah, he's just just some charlatan fly-by-night guy. They were actually giving glory to Satan for God's work. Now think about that statement. They're seeing a miracle take place and from God and they're giving glory to the evil one for it. If you ever had a rut-row moment in your life, you know what I'm talking about, a rut-row? You know, a Scooby-Doo rut-row moment? Yeah, this is one of those rut-row moments. This is whenever somebody does that, you want to step away and say, I don't want to be associated with this. And these were the ones leading the people. And they were attributing the work of God to Satan. Notice the irony. He's driving out demons, and they're still asking for signs. People's mouths are opened. Their ears are opened. Their eyes are opened. People are receiving the dead back to life. Miracles, water is turned to wine. People are being fed 5,000 with a whole lot left over. And they say, it's by Satan he does it. Ouch. Ouch. We don't ever want to get that dark. Now you know why he's talking about how darkness creeps in. Well, he comes along. Verse 17 says this. Jesus says, knew their thoughts and said, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim I drive out demons by by Beelzebub. But, before I get to that, simple logic. If I, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, how does that even make sense? Why would Satan want to even thwart his own work? It makes no sense. And the, the ones who thought they knew it were like, well, you know, you got a point there. But, verse 20, If I drive out demons by the finger of God, by the authority and power of God, which is not some incantation and big showy thing. It basically says, remember the herd of pigs and the legion? You demons go over there by the finger of God, by the power and authority of God, you leave and they submit. But if I'm doing that by the power and authority of God, 
then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You accuse me, Jesus says, of doing Satan's work. But if I am doing God's work, what have you just done? You've just blasphemed God. That, my brothers and sisters, in Matthew and Mark, it talks about, is that unforgivable sin. It's not that, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to hit it. But you better watch out if we ever start saying that work is from Satan, not from God. Let God determine that. That one was for free. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the plot divides up the plunder. Jesus says, I am the strong man that has stepped into the realm of Satan and taken what is his. You're looking for something greater. You're attributing this to this work here to Satan. Well, I just stepped into Satan's realm, took back what he had power over and made him flee. And this guy is now talking. That is evidence. There's your sign. And then in verse 23, He comes along with this warning. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. What an impure spirit comes out of a person by my authority, by the authority of the finger and the power of God. It goes through arid places seeking rest, but doesn't find it. Then it says, I'm going to return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order because that's what Jesus does doesn't he he sweeps it clean he puts it in order how many of us came dirty and chaotic and now find ourselves as Leslie said 10 years later swept clean put in order then it goes in and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the final condition of that person is worse than the start what in the world is he talking about two things Start with me, stay with me. We have a tendency to start strong, but not finish strong. We do this, we do this. Jesus would say, abide or remain in me. He would say, the sheep know me and come to me. He would say, let my word fall on good soil so the seed will grow. There's a tendency uh, in the first century church and the 21st century church to not finish well. That's why Hebrews is written. Hebrews was written to those who were facing some tough stuff and they're like, you know what, maybe this isn't worth it and we're going to leave and we're going to go back under the law. And he says, don't do that, Jesus is better. And we may have not gone back under the law of Judaism, but we may have gone back under the law of sin and death and left Jesus and said, I'm going to try it my own way again. Don't do that. Stay with Jesus. But I can't figure this out. It doesn't make sense. I'm not so sure. I'm scared. Stay with Jesus. Do not leave. Revelation called those Christians that are shrinking back lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. It's a problem for us. Repentance is more than a one-time thing when when we come to Jesus. It's a continual turn coming to Jesus. There are things in my life, I've been around since 1987, but there are still, I've got a long way to go. I still got things in my life that the Lord reveals. It's like peeling an onion. And that turn, there is this initial turn in repentance to the Father. But that sanctification, that holiness, that walk is a continual turn because as my eyes are open and there's more spirits, what Romans 8 talks about, and there's more spirit and there's less flesh, I'm realizing, oh, I've got to turn from that. Oh, I didn't realize that was in there. And he's revealing in the scales and, and there is not blindness and there's more and more light. And I'm seeing things clearly and I want Jesus to shine on those dark places. That's why we say, David Owen says on Friday nights, on chip night, keep what? Keep coming back. Why? Because repentance and turning to God is a lifelong process. We've been given a great gift from God. We get to see the larger plan of God. We get to see promises fulfilled that were predicted and we get to hope and anticipation of the ultimate promise of him coming back previously angels and prophets says in first peter long to look and understand what they were seeing and in writing about luke 
in the early part of Luke 11 says, the Father has given us these great things to reveal Jesus and himself through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you have this gift from the Father and, and don't, don't use it and don't remain with him, it'll be worse off. It'll be worse off than had you ever not known at all. This wicked generation didn't remain with God and they left. Second Peter says it's like a dog returning to its vomit and a pig to its mud. Pretty graphic. Remain with him. Start with him. Finish with him. Even if it's tough, stay with the Lord. Don't leave. If you find yourself, we used to say this at camp, if you find yourself by yourself, you're not where you're supposed to be. The same thing, that's, those are true words for our life. If you find yourself by yourself away from the people of God, you're not where you should be. Remain with God. Remain with his people. Well, we're back to, we'll mention one thing before we get back to where we started. There was this group of people, the scoffers that were, you know, he's doing it by the prince of demons Beelzebub and then there's this group that comes along it says you know we called them the fans oh it's by uh uh show us another sign you know they're, they're like oh he's getting on them pretty good I'm going to scoot over here well he has this little section for them we won't get into but he basically says ho 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 you wicked generation that asked for a sign none's going to be given to you who me yeah you you that want a sign here's the sign Jonah as he was in the belly of the fish for three days that's your sign. It's about the resurrection. And then, understand this, there was a lady that came to see Solomon in all, her splen all his splendor, and she recognized him as great. Now, someone greater than Solomon has come along, and you miss it. There's your sign right there. No other sign is going to be given to you. Quit asking. So he really puts the hammer down on people, doesn't he? Jesus, as they sometimes say, I've heard, don't play. <laughs> Well, that brings us back to verse 33 that Jacob read for us. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it'll be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is also full of light. Isn't that true? You see this? Your eye is the lamp of the body. It's what you put in is, is what's going to illuminate inside of you. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body is also full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. It's an odd phrase, isn't it? See to it that the light within you is not darkness. See the truth know the truth, embrace the truth. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines on you. So here's our take home. Darkness blinds, light illuminates. It's a simple fact, but boy, that's hard to live out sometimes, isn't it? Because there's something about the dark that we're drawn to. Something. Sin is progressive in nature. Once dark sets in, it grows. Paul would say it starts with a darkening of understanding. This is in Ephesians. There's futile thinking, and then there's a darkening of understanding, and then darkness comes out of us in our behavior. Do you remember where you were or that point in your life when you caught a glimpse of the light and you realized, oh my goodness, I'm full of darkness. How did I get here? I remember it well, and I was already a Christian. But I'd let myself become that wallower in the mud. And it became a point where everything I loved and held dear was on the verge of being gone. And I can remember the words whenever the jolt came and I said, how did I get so far away from God? That didn't come out of my mind. That came from the Holy Spirit. And I remember those words. And because of good people that sit in this room today, 
God is glorified. Do you remember when you saw clearly your need for Jesus? What was it like? Was it a slowed realization? Was it a, a jolt of reality? Heard from some of our online members this week that came down last year, well, about a year ago this weekend, actually, from Ohio. And he was a Christian. His wife was just wavering, not real sure. We sat, we studied, we visited. Well, she was baptized this week. And so congratulations, Tiffany. He was, her husband was excited to, to let us know. And he had been working with her, praying for her. We'd been in contact a little bit uh, over the last year. It was a slow realization, coming to grips with things. However it is, move towards the light. Light illuminates, darkness blinds. Darkness rejects, light embraces. There are many in here who never thought they would be in here today. There are many watching who never thought <laughs> they would ever watch something that had to do with the Lord. There are many here that many probably thought they'll never be here. <laughs> and you might have shown up and they're like, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, the building didn't fall in because grace covers a whole lot, doesn't it? For some, you've never been that direct enemy of God, but never experienced the grace and the freedom found in Christ. Uh, this world has a way of doing that. We may not just go have the largest sin resume in the world, but, but man, I sure can be bound by, by a whole lot of junk in my head and a lot of shame. Now, both those whose sin resume is as big as this room and those whose aren't worship the same God saved by the same grace. Isn't that amazing? Maybe that's why they called it amazing grace. Darkness invites evil. Light scatters evil. As we continue in Christ, putting light in our lives, there's less and less evil. As mentioned earlier, that's the whole point of Romans chapter 8. There's less flesh, there's less of me, and more of the Holy Spirit in my life. So how do I do that? You put God's Word in. You hang out with His people. You let people teach. You speak life into people and let life be spoken to you. Whenever these doors are open, be here. When they're not, come on up anyway. We'll let you come in and pray and visit with us. There are people that come just hang out with our staff because, hey, they're a pretty good group to hang out with. And sometimes they need that life. We've had people come up and say, I feel like I'm going to relapse. Well, don't do that. Come on up. We'll find something to do. You know, you can. That's why we're here. Find God's people and hang out with them. Find good things and let it be poured into you. Worship God privately and publicly. There's something, there is private worship is a beautiful thing, but there is something awesome when God's people get together and raise the roof, is it not? Darkness flees in the presence of God. And it says in Psalms that God inhabits our praise. He lives in our praise. So whenever you don't know what to do, when your mind is hijacked and you're just not real sure, praise God. What is it, Paul? Philippians Philippians 4. If you don't know what that means, go ask Paul. He'll spend up, but you better, better bring a sandwich because he'll, 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 he'll tell you everything you want to know about how everything's noble and right and good and holy. Think on these things and praise God. And I mean that in a great way. Darkness leads to a shrinking back and giving up. Light leads to leaning in and finishing strong. Hebrews 10 says, We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are those who have faith and preserve their souls. Revelation 12, a very favorite verse of a lot of us, says this, They triumphed over him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. They leaned yeah. into it, and they said, Bring it on, whatever you got, because in... The presence of God where there is light, we lean into that and it scatters evil. Darkness causes people to shrink back. Light finishes strong. The Apostle Paul was one of those wicked generation people. Blinded by darkness, he tried with all his power 
and the power of Satan to stamp out Christianity, but literally, not figurative, literally, his light fell on him and his life was illuminated. And when he did, he embraced it fully and began to scatter through the power of God evil from all over the then known world. The rest of his life, he lived in the protection of living in the light. Sometimes it was physical protection, sometimes it wasn't. Always lived confident, knowing where his eternity was held. And he wrote this, some of his final words, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. When we shine from the inside out, we walk that same journey. We walk in a broken world. You turn on the news, there are people all over the world suffering. There are people in this room that are suffering because of the brokenness of this world. Unfairness, injustice, and we can't base our growth and our healing and our faith on justice being taken care of in this world. We have to heal and love even when injustice takes place because more injustice happens to people than justice. All wrongdoers don't go to jail. But God's judgment is going to be sure and true, and that's how we find healing. The question is, are we walking in darkness or in light? It's a dark, broken world. The gospel came. John 1 says Jesus came stepping into a dark world and it scattered darkness. God in flesh, dying on a cross to take our darkness, rising from the dead to scatter the power of darkness, and now opens heaven up for us, this direct access to the Father, full of light that comes out into us. That's the gospel we embrace. You see the symbols everywhere. That's what we do. That's why we do what we do. If you're walking in darkness, why? Stop. Embrace the light. And that's what this invitation is about. Also, a time for you to share a concern, a joy, a prayer request. We're here for you while we stand and sing.